Welcome to the VLDB 2020 tutorial titled Data Collection and Quality Challenges for Deep Learning. I'm Stephen Huang, co-presenting with J.K. Lee. We are both from KAIST. As a brief introduction of the speakers, I am an assistant professor at KAIST EE and Graduate School of AI. Previously, I was at Google Research and Stanford University. My research interests include big data AI integration and responsible AI. My lab is supported by a Google AI focused research award. Jekyll is an associate professor tenured at the KAIST Graduate School of Knowledge Service Engineering. Previously, he was at IBM Almaden Research Center and University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. His research interests include spatial temporal data mining, scalable machine learning, and data quality issues for deep learning. He has a best paper award at AAAI ICWSM 2013 and is an associate editor of IEEE TKD and the steering committee member of PAKDD since 2019. So nowadays, deep learning is widely used to glean knowledge from massive amounts of data. There is a wide range of applications, starting from natural language understanding, like Google Translate, healthcare, like diabetic retinopathy, self-driving cars, games, and more. The reason deep learning has become so prevalent is thanks to its excellent performance. And that's due to mainly two game changers. The first one being the availability of big data. So I don't need to convince this audience that of the importance of data, but I still like to show this slide. So one zettabyte amounts to 10 to the 12 gigabytes. And it's known that to store this amount of data, you need to build data centers that amount to one great wall of China. So that's a lot of data centers. Now below, you can see an estimate of the total amount of data in this world for each year. The x-axis shows year, y-axis is number of zettabytes. So let's take a look at this year in 2020, there seems to be about 50 zettabytes of data. And in 2025, this is when hopefully some of my students get their PhDs. Uh, it's projected to grow to 175 zettabytes, a huge increase. So I think it's safe to say that data will always increase exponentially. And that seems to be the constant here. Game changer number two is fast computation. So a few years ago, I remember this discussion within Google uh, worrying about the large computation cost of speech recognition in handheld devices. Uh, this is when speech recognition was really becoming a thing. The problem was that the computation not only had to, had to be done within the devices, but also uh, in data centers. And so in order to support all the cell phone users in the world, uh, Google would ha have to either double or triple their data centers, uh, which is uh, infeasible, or somehow uh, in improve the computation speed. So what they came up with is tensor processing units, or TPUs, which are processors that can perform machine learning operations like uh, model inference and model training orders of magnitude faster than conventional CPUs and GPUs. So using this technology, uh, Google was able to build systems like AlphaGo, which could play the game of Go really well and uh, beat world champions. So this wide usage of deep learning is uh, sometimes referred to as a new paradigm in software engineering, uh, coined Software 2.0. Uh, this was uh, first used by Andre Karpathy. And uh, in order to 
be convinced that this is a new, new paradigm, we need to look at conventional software engineering first. So in conventional uh, software engineering, you have these requirements and designs. And after that, you uh, implement your, uh, your design. So for example, if you're implementing a core component of Linux, uh, you, you implement, say, uh, millions of lines of code um, in, say, C or C++. And then you verify your code and uh, debug using unit tests and then keep on maintaining that code. Now in software 2.0, uh, data becomes very important. A first class citizen that's on par with code because fundamentally machine learning is about learning some function from data. And so uh, without very good data, your model is not going to be um, have the accuracy that you want. And it's known that data preparation is a very expensive step in end-to-end -end machine learning. So uh, for all the time spent on developing your machine learning application, uh, preparing your data, which includes collecting your data, uh, analyzing it, and cleaning it, and also making it suitable for mach machine learning train model training, takes 80% or more of your time. Also, the code here tends to be high level. So if you implemented code using TensorFlow or Py PyTorch, you may have noticed that the number of lines you code is much fewer than the lines you code, say, in uh, C or C++ languages. There's also these repeated experimentations where even after you train your model, that's not the end of uh, the process, you need to keep on uh, improving it by uh, using hyperparameter tuning. So many people view this as a new software engineering paradigm, hence the uh, word software 2.0. And companies have been aware of this problem for from many years ago. And so for example, uh, Google developed its own solution called TensorFlow Extended or TFX. Now, for those of you who know TensorFlow, that's a system for training models, but that's not the only step in the entire machine learning process. Uh, before training, you need to ingest your data, analyzing, analyze and validate your data to make sure your data is suitable for training. And after model training, you need to evaluate your model, uh, manage them, and also serve them to the world. And so all of these steps are supported by TensorFlow Extended. There are many other systems as, as well. So Databricks implemented MLflow, uh, which recently joined the Linux Foundation. I, IBM has a system DS. So the first three are open source systems. There are also many closed source systems by these companies. And the reason I know about them is because they have uh, their publications. So Apple has a system, uh, Microsoft has it's this, this uh, machine learning systems. Facebook has FB Learner, uh, Uber has Michelangelo, and Amazon has its own uh, system as well. And there are probably more that I am not aware of. So interestingly, if you look at the specifics of an um, ML system, a lot of its components resemble conventional systems. So here are the components of uh, some machine learning system in Google. And each rectangle here represents a component where the size of the rectangle is proportional to the number of lines of code. So here you see on the left a configuration, uh, which is very important because this uh, machine learning system is complicated and used by many users. And so it's important for users to be able to easily uh, con set up configurations and run the system. There's also a uh, data collection, data verification components, uh, resource management, uh, monitoring, and so on. And these are all uh, conventional components that exist in, in any other system. Now in the middle, you see this small component in red color called ML code. And this is where all the machine learning algorithm code resides in. And it's said to be that this component is less than 5% of the entire system.
Here's another way to view end-to-end -end machine learning in a data management point of view. So you start from input data. It, it, there's training data and serving data. This is followed by a preparation step where uh, you can do feature engineering if you want features, or and you, can, you need to convert the raw data into features that are suitable for training. After that, you do this validation where you check for any errors in the data. If, the, if you find any, you need to clean that data and update the input data. Now, after you have a, you come up with the training data, you uh, use it to train a model using uh, systems like TensorFlow and PyTorch. And after you train your model, you need to evaluate it. So here, you measure accuracy on some uh, test data. But you also want to uh, split your, the, uh, input, the input data into different slices, say by country or by population or age range, and make sure the model performs well on each and every one of the slices. The model is then served to the world. And if you, have, uh, if you train many models, then now you have to maintain the versions of the models and you have a model management problem. So in many of these steps, uh, we need to address data quality issues. Now, unfortunately, most of the research effort has been uh, spent on machine learning algorithms instead of uh, the data. And so I think most of you know uh, who Mike Stonebreaker is. He recently published an interesting article in the IEEE Data Bulletin, and he summarizes his ex experience of interacting with various companies that sometimes use machine learning and sometimes don't. And here's my favorite quote. He says that our favorite complaint is that research institutions appear to spend 90% of their ML efforts on algorithms and 10% on data preparation. In our opinion, it should be 90-10 the other way. So as a data management person, I couldn't agree more. Which leads to this tutorial. So in this tutorial, we investigate data quality challenges that occur in deep learning. So here's a simplified diagram of end-to-end -end machine learning. We start from data collection, then perform data cleaning and validation, then we do model training, then model evaluation, then model management and serving. And this tutorial will cover the first three steps here. Topic one is data collection. So in comparison to traditional machine learning, in deep learning, feature engineering is less of a concern, but there is instead a need for large amounts of training data. And many industries, unfortunately, do not adapt deep learning because simply because of the lack of data. Uh, the second reason being the lack of explainability of the models. So data collection is extremely important to uh, use deep learning. Topic two is data cleaning and validation. While there is a vast literature on data cleaning, uh, unfortunately, not all the techniques directly benefit deep learning uh, accuracy. Also, there are recent deep learning issues, including data poisoning that need to be addressed, especially in the data management community. So data poisoning is, uh, has the intention of reducing uh, the model accuracy. And so there's a research called uh, data sanitization where the goal is to defend against such attacks. So data sanitization is similar to data cleaning, but has this uh, aspect of defending. Uh, and so it's very relevant, but has not been well studied in the data management community uh, until now. Topic three is model training. So even after we carefully prepare our data, validate and clean it, uh, data quality may still be problematic. So there's no guarantee we fixed all the data problems. And so we still need to cope with biased, dirty or missing data uh, in model training. 
And fortunately, there are various fair and robust uh, training uh, techniques available, and we will cover them uh, extensively. So in summary, deep learning is prevalent thanks to big data and fast computation. Software 2.0 is a new paradigm for software engineering. However, uh, big data for deep learning has been relatively understudied.